Let's just start with the big idea. And the big idea is that biology gives us the potential to create atomically precise, infinitely scalable technologies that could address some of the biggest, most planetary scale problems, but also opportunities for creating public goods. That's at the limit. At the moment, we're really far away from there. So what I want to do is just talk to you as a member of a community that's trying to get us to that limit and how we're so excited to be growing this community with your support. I'm going to start a high, and then we're going to go into the tangibles. And so the core thesis here is that we're at the ideas-limited regime of forming climate tech, meaning that there's people who want to work on it, there's, there's, more, there's funders that want to fund it, there's just not enough good ideas. So our theory of change is to build that critical mass of funders, doers, and scalers in, to accelerate that um, climate-positive biotechnology. So I want to give you one of my biggest mental models for the way I think about growth, which is that the greatest feeling in life is having great ideas and the ability to act on it. And I think what's so cool about this, as well as if you think about it, that great ideas and the ability to act on them form a virtuous circle. Meaning that sometimes when you have a really good idea, that inspires you to build the skills to build it, but also once you have the newest skill to build something, that exposes you to new great ideas that were pre previously opaque. And that's true for individuals, but I think the most productive communities also have this as a, as a necessary condition. And this is what I'm gonna be talking to you about. Now, before we go into too many like, broader details, I need to introduce myself. And I'm kind of a weird mutt, so I'm gonna fly through this really quick, but I was a PhD dropout at Stanford. I got to work with the amazing Fei Fei Li. <clears throat> I started drifting away too far from people, so I went to the other extreme where I worked in, the, in product design, and I built an app with Elmo, and I was at the great firm IDEO. Um, as an entrepreneur in residence. My mentor and I there spun out. We created a mobile app company called um, Mobile Data Labs, which created a product called Mile IQ. And then I realized that all my greatest heroes in life are the people that pick one thing and spend decades on it, and by a mixture of luck and timing and whatever else, they end up making an impact. And so the answer for me was to go back to academia because I wanted that to be neuroscience for me. So I got to work with the amazing Ed Boyden, I worked under George Church and another hero, Sebastian Sung, uh, and we built a first-of-kind technology where we were able to visualize rich inf uh, molecular information inside intact brains. But this thing happened to me in 2019 where my friend Sarah Sklarsik put together this negative emissions technology workshop. And there was, a big, there was a very big moment because suddenly climate was reframed in my head for it. It was no more just like looking at photos of dead polar bears. It was reframing it as a set of technological challenges. And technological challenges is what I do. So, Let's just briefly run through this. What's a negative emission technology? Well, it's something magic that just draws carbon dioxide out of the air. Everybody says we're gonna need this. But when you think about what this looks like at scale, well, if you were to draw down a billion tons of carbon dioxide, if you put it into the density of uh, dry ice, it would be roughly as big as a World Trade Center building. Um, that costs a trillion dollars if we can scale linearly and probably even more unrealistic, it takes 10% of the world's energy. So we have a lot of work to do. And so, like, I've got no interest in trying to sound cooler than I am. I went super arrogant when I first started going into this. So I thought, okay, I'm just going to map the space of carbon dioxide capture, and that's what I'm going to do, and it'll be done. And the more I worked alone, the less I did. And I became really frustrating. I was just writing these reports to myself, and there was the one thing that I learned is I just need to be engaging with people more and more. And so as that grew, uh, it, it, we came across something called the MIT Climate Grand Challenge. And since this is a, since this is a funding-themed event, I think it's really important to tell you guys about this model because it's very impactful for me and also very impactful for the community that ended up growing. And so it was a very simple idea. MIT said, let's just give 100 grand for early-stage teams to write those same white papers that I was writing to myself, but to, to then make a two-page uh, letter of intent that you can then share with the community. And then from there, that you use that money just to make the bigger pitch. What's the larger project that you could do? What this meant is that people became, came together to collaborate. And so for me, it was my friend Paul. We knew each other from the beginning of our, media, uh, our PhD days. And also people like Professor Lauren Luger, who's one of my heroes from neuroscience, also trying to get into climate tech. So what this meant is that we would go to these different talks of these people who got this 100K. And I've been in a lot of entrepreneurship. I've been in a lot of science environments. I've never seen people so collaborative because the scarcity was taken away with everyone had a little bit of this money. And what came from this is we made this monster, you know, 30 PI proposal. It didn't get funded, but a lot of other good came out of it. And that's really what I want to share with you guys. So the first thing that came out of it is I was able to get out of writing reports and just being in my head, and I was able to do the most important thing, which is actually try stuff, right? So 
we took rocks, we dropped acid on them, and we wanted to see, can you weather these rocks? And like, a lot of these things, like, what's important from there is we began to build intuition and stuff that we were really good at in our lab, like microscopy, actually was giving us some sort of useful signal that we could imagine future technologies. But the most important thing is that a community grew from this. So in the beginning, it was just us in the Boyden lab and the church lab, and you can just see that there was just a few of us chatting on Slack. When the Climate Grand Challenge came in, we had this 100K and this reason to be interacting with our labs, we had a little bit of growth where now it was dozens of people. And then something magical happened around December 2021 where we just started getting this organic growth. And this is where I think a lot of the joy and, and value that perhaps was unexpected now became like totally clear. Um, so we had this online community that was very rigorous and warm and people are just throwing around ideas, we're making lectures, you know, um, and you get these very, very like, highly technical conversations, but people coming at it from a lot of different angles. So an online community was created. You know what, an offline community was created as well. <clears throat> and what came from this, and I think what we're most proud about in this community, is we have a high trust, rigorous culture. And this is what we want to continue growing. Now, we can take a pause here, we're like, okay, look, we've got something. We've got this community of over 200 people that really know what they're doing. Everyone's trying to have some sort of climate positive impact. Well, this is the part we need to be mindful about the way we grow. And a good question to ask here was like, what are the elements of a most productive community? And this is also why I wanted to give you a little bit of my personal background because you're gonna see this. So I think it's six elements, and let's, be, let's start with one which we all know really well. So in machine learning, what Fei Fei did is by creating ImageNet is she created a hyperproductive community where you, everyone's got the same platform to just try things. Everyone's got a laptop and they can download code. Once you have something that kind of works in, com in computer science, the path to scale is obvious. And that's a really big thing that happened in the early 2000s. We had these common goals which everyone agreed on was hard, everyone, and there's this idea of enforceable honesty, which is like just as if you say something, it doesn't matter, you have to be able to prove it. The playbooks for outside success were created with things like Y Combinator, and then what does it take to try an experiment? Well, you just need enough food to, you need enough money to eat ramen. And so I, we look at this, I think, as a hyper-productive community. Now, I was at Stanford in 2009 in computer science. I saw this change. I was in biotech in 2015. I saw the exact same cultural change. So when Jennifer Dwadna created CRISPR, we saw the same shift where this biotechnologists in uh, like PhD students were now using phrases like product market fit, et cetera. But it's the same idea. Everyone had the ability to download, like everyone has hex cells, everyone has the ability to get plasmids, everyone has the ability to test on the same goal. In this case, it was cure rare monogenic diseases. And this is a hyper growth community because the, there end up being outsized impacts that had the people had the ability to scale. Now here's one that probably nobody was expecting, which is I think <laughs> I'm not here to bro out about jujitsu, uh, but I, I've also been in the, the, the community for decade over, over a decade. And what's so cool about this is it has the exact same model. Everyone's got mats, everyone's got friends, and the whole idea of jujitsu is it's based on the idea of the spar, which is 100% effort, people trying to like take each other out. And that tests techniques, and the best techniques have risen to the top, and the sport looks totally different than it was a decade ago. There's also the idea of outsized impacts where people who make really good techniques are now making millions of dollars. So with this idea of what are hyperproductive communities, what about the biotech community that we're trying to build? Well, uh, we don't yet have common platforms. There's not the equivalent of the Hexcel or the GitHub. Um, our common scale-up is not quite there either. I mean, huge shout out to Stripe uh, for what they've done in building, and they've done these advanced market commitments. But it's still not this idea where anyone can just pick up and start scaling. The common goals? I mean, we have like the idea that, okay, if we want to draw down carbon dioxide, we need $100 a ton. I mean, that's kind of a made-up number. It's a community agreed upon made-up number, but we have a lot of work to do on that. Same thing, like, how do you know what you're actually drawing down? That doesn't, that's in progress. So it's not, this is not a criticism, this is just like a very honest snapshot of like, this is where we're at in time, and we want to build a hyperproductive community, but we've got a lot of work to do. And I think a big part of our thesis and why I'm here today is that I, a, a very important starting point on this is to focus on the funding. And if you guys are interested in this, I've, uh, there's a public write-up on it. This is why we formed Homeworld. So Homeworld is the nonprofit to start supporting the activities of this community of planetary biotech. We've got a fantastic team with a lot of really important perspectives. And now we want to start supporting the community tangibly. Now, I'm going to absolutely rip off Juan's innovation chasm, because this is a big motivation for the initial way we started thinking about it, which is that in academia, there's an optimal scale, and then industry needs a certain point to start running. 
And when we think about the innovation chasm, we think about that gap between academia and industry. But there's a really uh, like, important other part, and the focus where we want to stand is that while there's a lot of funding innovation happening, industries going earlier into science, as Ella was talking about, and academia is figuring out how to scale up with things like focused research organizations, everyone listen to Anastasia. <clears throat> there's, what we identified is there's nothing before the publishable result, that pre-proof of concept. You need something to get funding, that's crazy. So what we wanna focus on is building this community of this bottom-up science. We wanna support people trying the very early ideas that have potential but nobody else is funding. And this can take two ideas, right? This can take um, scalable, like mature ideas from other domains and apply them in the context of, of bio, uh, climate tech. Or we wanna make sure that if you're trying something and it fails, that at least the, like, the community grows somehow. And part of my PhD was in these giant labs where you know, in a lab of 80 people, there's gonna be that person who's tried everything already and really, really good ideas just failed because biology fails sometimes. And that knowledge gets lost because it doesn't leave the walls of that lab. But this, these are problems that people have talked about perennially. And I think that if we can fund this thing the right way, we can start capturing this as well. So what, is, what currently serves this? Well, fast grants for huge innovation that happened about two years ago. And fellowships have always been like the canonical way. Like let's fund the person, not necessarily the idea. And I think those are great. Um, I think we can do even more there. So this is where I think we're at currently in climate tech. We're at the limit of technology now. Like we can't just scale up what we already have. We need new, like brand new ideas. And one way to just measure that briefly is that if you look at the climate tech unicorns, only recently did we start getting academic spin outs. Everything else is scaling up things like innovations from the like battery manufacturing from Tesla or up to applying a computer science solution you know, into something that's relevant to climate. But I think now we really need brand new ideas. And this is what Homeworld is trying to support the community to build. One thing that we've discovered a lot is that good ideas are stuck on the shelf, meaning that people have had ideas for a while, but there's no way to fund it. Networks need to be built, and that's what we've been doing for a while. And I can unpack a lot of stories where some fields are more adept at limber funding and others aren't. Um, geology is a little behind the curve, whereas like, things like computer science is very nimble. And then I think most importantly is it's more than just the tech idea. I think you, need to de you can de-risk the science, but you can also de-risk the path to impact. So this is the three main questions that we ask when we think about how do we support brand new, first of kind ideas. The first thing is, what's the frontier? What are you actually even steering for? And, then it, like, and that can be determined by the community. The second question is, what's the first experiment? Like, how do you know that's a good idea, and what do you learn if you can do that experiment? And then the third thing, which I think is underappreciated in academia, is the idea, well, well, even if that's true, how do you navigate the path to impact? And I think that's the role of the scalers, the people who have seen this before, the senior leaders that have the 30 years experience that has some patterns to apply. Now, this is stuff that, what I'm saying here is stuff that funding 1.0 can't accomplish. There's just a misalignment for academic trajectories to think about translational science, especially in the context of climate, that is. There's this idea that we select against ambition because a lot of these coolest ideas are zero to, like they're zero or one. They either work or they don't. And that doesn't really fit when you're trying to apply for these grants that take a year to apply for, and then you, like, that's gonna be multiple years, so something has to kind of work. And I guess last, I'm just, so this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a fast grant format for early stage climate tech. And I think it's really worth saying that like, this has to be beyond ramen neutral. <laughs> like a lot of these experiments when you do biotech or something adjacent to that is you're talking at least like 50K just in the, the reagents, much less to the person actually eating. Um, now we want to be as efficient as possible. So we talk about this idea of doing selectively tranched research where if you come up with something that's just too wild, great, can we just de-risk it a little bit before, you, before we fund you. And then more than just the money, let's make sure that you're getting paired with the mentors that can help you navigate that path to impact. Now, we are starting with biotech, but there's many other fields that would follow the same, the same pattern. There's more things to, like, interesting things to talk about than like, the, the, the format, but I think a lot of this is just gonna be intuitive. We want to do a very minimal format, and we're gonna frame it like the what's the big if true, right? The big is, is determined by like working with the mentors to say this is your path to impact, and the if true comes from the scientists who are trying to, to, to validate that with their first experiment. We're creating an idea of peer reviews. So the people who are applying are also gonna be reviewing other people. And I think one thing that I want to personally wanna see change in, in science is to do non-anonymized, de-anonymized peer review, 
One thing that we've learned in the community is people are, they can be viciously rigorous, but that's productive because when you know who that person is who's criticizing your idea, they're gonna be generative too. And from the other side, from working with anonymous peer review in science, it can just be a nightmare. So these are things that we wanna actively innovate with and we're trying things today. Now, the big question is like, okay, like climate is this huge problem. Like what, what, like what specific parts do you want to, like, to focus on? And so the spirit of what we want to do is we want to be supporting bottom-up science, meaning that there's going to be people that are going to roadmap things to at the very top, what are the most important problems and all the individual parts. Or the other way to do it is like, let's just come up with the nucleation points and the, fun, the mechanisms for people to work on it and then let the science be done from the bottom up. And so in this service, we were, create, we we're working on something called the benchmarks. So that's the thing that I gave myself an impact certificate for, which kind of feel, <laughs> kind of, I think maybe somebody else should have given it to me. Uh, but this is a, pro like a project that I thought was gonna be really easy and it's turned out to be really hard, which is like, let's just like ImageNet for computer science had a very clear score. We need these same ideas if we wanna get climate tech or biotech to have agreed upon goals that people can be innovating around. And so we made a list, we have 11 so far, and I'm gonna be really honest, like this is a work in progress. There's some things that are good about it and there's some things that are bad. What's good is that we can start putting numbers on the, like, numbers on the board and this, like, some of these things can be motivating people to do experiments in a lab. But other things like $100 CO2 capture, for example, that's really hard to do in a lab. You can't, like, all you can do is do a small experiment and make an argument about why that might scale. So this is something that we want to be engaging with the community on and so, uh, and I think this is, I think this is in the, the early stage of an exponential impact, where if you get good benchmarks, good benchmarks lead to good sub-problems, good sub-problems lead to good infrastructure for people to be doing experiments rapidly. And so let me give you an example of what this can create. So uh, we, we published these benchmarks in the community, and then two people came back, like two groups came back with an interesting idea. And this is like, this follows the format of what we wanna see. It's like, okay, cool, if you wanna start really drawing down carbon dioxide, Cows are produced three gigatons a year, one of the biggest leverage, levers we have. Biotech has gotten really good at protein design. So can we take gold standard medical grade biotech and can we then apply that into the cow rumen? And so the people working on this are also the exact kind of people you want to engage in terms of you've got an RPE expert and you've got a successful biotech entrepreneur that's seen things scale before and want to steer them towards this. And so while they, what they need is the funding just to try that first experiment. And one thing that we have also in our community is this path to impact support. So when we ask, like, what do you need? They're like, oh, we need animal health experts and we need synthetic biology leadership to scale up these ideas. So another idea, uh, the idea of like, synthetically fixed nitrogen is perhaps a little bit opaque to people on the outside, but it's crazy that we're having the, like, we have such a huge carbon footprint from producing nitrogen when maybe we can just make the plants do it themselves. This is another thing where you can take world-class stuff from medical biotech and you can apply it in the climate tech space. And so this is an idea that was kind of shaken out of the tree by these benchmarks, and then the guy that has proposed this project is a world-class CRISPR screening guy. And so we wanna see if we can improve the way plants fix nitrogen using cutting-edge biomedical techniques. And same thing, it's like, what do you need to scale this? Like, if, you know, big if true. Let's do the if true on the science side, but then who can validate the big and help navigate that path to impact? So. These are two kind of projects, there's a whole bunch more of these things coming, we need to be funding them. So we're aiming to support a portfolio of ideas like this on the order of 10 to 25 of them. And the reason we want a portfolio is that we want to start seeing what the scale after they get to the proof of concept is. And I think we just need the, like, we need, we need the portfolio to see like, where different projects can go. The other thing is that we need to get gold standard um, tool builders in the software world to help us support this. I think a lot of people that are here are focusing on building new stacks for science. And this, I think what we're doing with planetary biotech, I think is a perfect edge case for these things that you need more funding than just ramen. So let's figure this out. And the, like, you know, the community that we've built of 200 people is gonna continue growing. And we also wanna be engaging with people who really know how to grow cultures mindfully, because what we love so much about our warm, rigorous, open culture, we need to preserve. So if this works, well, where can it go? Well, we can do more than biotech. We can explore earlier and faster financial support. We want to, you know, I think we were talking about this and, and uh, uh, 50 Years was talking about this as well, which is that we want to be able to train self-advocacy for the practitioners. And so we've seen, I've seen computer scientists learn how to say the phrase product market fit. I've seen biotechnologists know how to use the word product market fit. 
product market fit when you're talking in planet, you know, climate tech and biotech is way much more difficult. So we want to be supporting that next wave of entrepreneurs. And then we want to imagine like what the future of, of science institutes looks like. And it's funny that this, start, this whole thing is starting online and remote and distributed. So there's a lot more to say, but I'm going to pause it here. And I just want to say thank you guys so much for having us over here. I can't wait to talk to you guys more in this community and see how we can collaborate on this. So thank you guys and talk to you soon.